Now that I have your attention, uh, we're going to get started here with this segment and uh, we're talking about network resiliency. And uh, kind of an idea for that was the ice storm of 2009. Anybody that was in this area, I, I know we've got people from all over, but if you were in this area, uh, me and Kevin were just talking, it was almost like uh, what would have happened if a nuclear bomb went off. I mean, it was that devastating. Uh, I remember being uh, in, at the Walmart in Mayfield where they were literally letting people in 10, pe uh, 10 people at a time and they were walking around Walmart with flashlights in the grocery aisles. It was like something off the movies. Uh, and I don't think anybody was quite prepared for that. Let me tell you a little tidbit. In September of 2008, the fall before the ice storm, if you'll remember, again if you're from this area, Hurricane Ike sent some uh, uh, hurricane winds up here and uh, it knocked down the power lines at my house and so uh, the power went off on Sunday and we were without power believe it or not four whole days I'd never in my life gone without power for four whole days and I remember telling my wife I said this will never happen to me again I will be prepared if this ever happens, four days without power, this is ridiculous. Fast forward a few months to the ice storm. And as I stood on the front porch and listened to limbs crash down all around me and literally watched my power line drop break in half before my very eyes, I remembered I didn't learn my lesson a few months ago. I didn't have a generator, I didn't have my propane tanks full, because you know why? You think it's never going to happen to me, it's never going to happen to me again. And that's so naive, isn't it? And as network administrators, as telecommunications company, it's naive to think that these things can't happen again. Uh, I got a little picture here that uh, I like to, uh, to recall, you know, learn from the past uh, or be destined to repeat it. Um, you can either... Uh, paint on the boot as it comes crashing down on you or you could move out of the way and I think sometimes we uh, in the telecommunications industry we have become uh, oblivious to the things that go around us sometimes and if we don't learn if we don't adapt if we don't change then we'll be facing some of the same struggles uh, that we've already faced in the past again that ice storm it was devastating uh, beyond measure you, you can see some of the pictures here that are from this area uh, of this ice storm. Uh, you, you can't imagine, um, you know, if you didn't live through it, it it's hard to explain. Uh, you can't really uh, take into, uh, you know, that looks real pretty, but it doesn't when you're sitting there in overalls, digging out of, a, <laughs> uh, digging your car out and hoping that you can uh, find somewhere to go and get gas and kerosene. Um, I sat in a uh, line for kerosene at a gas station in, in Paducah. This is how long I sat in line. Now, I'm a Kentucky basketball fan. Uh, this was during the Billy Clyde experiment, that failed experiment, um, which just made that ice storm even worse, um, putting up with that, that horrific uh, couple of years. But I pulled into the, the driveway at the gas station, and it was countdown to tip off on the radio. I filled up my gas tank as Tom Leach signed off the broadcast. I listened to the entire Kentucky game, pre-game, game, post-game, post waiting in line for gas. Folks, this was a devastating storm. You can see here how much it hit Kentucky all over. Uh, Western Kentucky right here in our region where we're at right now was the, the biggest hit in the entire state. Over uh, half a million people without power, without connectivity. Um, WKT specifically where I work, WKT Telecommunications Cooperative in Mayfield, Kentucky. I want to give you a, a quick rundown of where our plant was at that time. Our outside plant in 2009, uh, the good thing was was 90% of it at least was in the ground. But that's not to uh, the user, that's just the plant. Uh, because uh, unfortunately you have 90% of your uh, plant in the ground but you've got 90% aerial drops. Uh, to the homes and businesses that we serve, uh, served at that time and so uh, we had a, a real difficult time. Uh, we had power all the way to the person's uh, home 
but then the drop from the from the network to the home or to the business uh, was was often damaged due to the the amount of aerial drops that we had to the locations. We had uh, 255 sites spread out over 22 exchanges in 10 counties and two states that required electricity in 2009. These are central offices. These are remote. Uh, stations out um, in the uh, areas that we serve. Um, one path into these 255 sites and one path out. So if a fiber cut was made or, or a copper cut made on either side of that site, then hundreds of customers were without service. And so 255 sites that didn't have electricity. I don't know uh, what companies or organizations you represent uh, but you don't typically have 255 generators just sitting around in case an ice storm comes up. So we had to pick and choose uh, which sites would get lit up before others in order to make sure that we could service the biggest bulk of our customers. If we could take a generator two counties over and get 500 people back on, then we couldn't uh, very well take that same generator to, uh, you know, out in the middle of rural Carlisle County for 10 customers. Those were tough decisions, but we did it for the, for the greater good. Uh, but again, this is, this is where we were as a company at that time. We had 89% of our drops that required pole attachments. Uh, and as you can see from the picture down here in the bottom right hand corner, the poles were struggling a little bit. Not only were trees falling and lines falling, but poles were literally snapping in half. And the electric company, we were paying uh, the electric company for most of our pole attachments and they couldn't get the poles back up fast enough. And so a lot of times we had the resources and the people on standby. We had the desire, we were gonna work around the clock, but until the electric company could get that pole back up, we were stuck. Uh, again, uh, not a very resilient network at that time. Uh, and because of all these things, unfortunately, we had customers without service uh, for uh, almost five weeks. Uh, we knew then, that we had some issues that we needed to address. Now we may never see another ice storm again in this region. I, I pray that we don't. I, I know uh, my grandparents said that they, you know, uh, they had lived a, a, in this area their whole lives and never seen anything like it. So I, I, I hope that we don't have to. Uh, but uh, fortunately, WKT is moving towards our fiber to the home project now. In 2011. Uh, with the help of uh, government stimulus funds, wk and began the process of converting 100% of our current copper plant to fiber to the home or fiber to the premise. And because of that, we're going to get some network resiliency and some redundancy uh, that's going to help us uh, weather the storms and the uncertainty uh, of the future. Let me tell you about where our plant's going to be this time uh, next year once our 100% fiber to the home conversion is complete. And, and we'll kind of compare that to where we were at the time of the ice storm. 100% um, of the outside plant will be in the ground. And not just the lines of the main construction lines, but the drops to the very house. We'll, we'll put the drop all the way to the home or to the business, and then we'll come up with an with a ONT, optical network terminal, on the outside of the home. And so there will be no e exposed uh, cables uh, where ice could build up on it and snap it or wind could blow it away. Uh, you know, that's a very uh, fortunate thing for us to know that uh, when this thing's done, the ice will not impact our network at all. Now there's uh, other things that may. Uh, sometimes, uh, believe it or not, our biggest trouble right now with people that's already been converted to fiber is when Fido digs up the drop and starts chewing on the fiber drop to the home. Uh, you know, our operations manager said, I wish that uh, they would quit uh, making those uh, fiber drops uh, Alpo flavored or whatever, because literally that's our biggest concern right now is that the dogs keep digging up the drops and chewing on them. But I tell you what, I'd much rather deal with that uh, than an ice storm. Uh, not only that, but uh, we have reduced, if you remember, uh, 255 in 2009, we have gotten that down to only 53 sites now that require electricity. Uh, that is a much more manageable number of sites than 255. Uh, and that just, that's because you don't have those distant limitations on fiber 
that you did on copper. Uh, we can go a lot further with our fiber without having to have a, a remote or a central office uh, and that really enables us to reduce the number of sites that require electricity. Not only that, but uh, we now have fiber rings in and out of those 53 sites uh, with multiple paths. So if uh, fiber's cut on one side or, or we have a, a problem on another, we have a redundant path. Uh, our network uh, uh, engineers, they like to put up this map uh, that, uh, and, and they, they, they get real tickled with this, uh, you know, and they want everybody to share in their excitement. Uh, I do more of the marketing and the sales and the product development, so I'm a very high level guy. But they like to put these maps up and then they like to just start showing these lines. They look like my, my attic when I get down my Christmas lights. That's what it looks like almost because there's just uh, different colored lines everywhere and they're showing you that, well, if this cuts here, we've got it from here, and if this cuts here, we've got it from there. And the, the idea is, is that no matter what happens, our network is redundant, it's resilient. And it's thinking that, you know what, nobody expected the ice storm to happen, but it did. And no one might expect the next uh, catastrophe or whatever the, the negative situation may be that would impact our network. But when and if that day comes, we're going to be ready. Uh, from an end user perspective, uh, we have uh, bandwidth 10 times faster than before. And that's just, uh, uh, and it said, I noticed I put 10 megabit, but that's not right. It's 60 megabit. Uh, we are maximum on copper DSL. Our fastest bandwidth that we could offer our uh, customers uh, was six uh, megabit. Now on fiber to the home, we are actually selling 60 megabit down uh, and 20 megabit up. Uh, I want you to know, folks, uh, I live in rural, rural Kentucky. There's literally three people down my road. When I look outside from any angle, I'm surrounded by cornfields. And I am 30 minutes away from the nearest McDonald's or Walmart or any of the luxuries of big city life like here in Murray and Mayfield. Um, now, I still have 20 megabit at my house. I don't know if we can fully appreciate what fiber to the home is bringing to, the, to rural America, but that's it that speeds that were once reserved for only the heavily populated areas, now fiber to the home, listen, we could get up to one gig. We had the potential with our ONT to get up to one gig. Now, I, there's, gonna, there's some gamer out there right now that's like, yeah, give me that gig, I need it, I need it. But technically, nobody needs a gig right now. But there may be a day when you do, and we'll be ready. So not only have we prepared ourselves for what could happen, but we've also future-proofed our network to say whatever technology comes in the future and everything's probably going to be deployed at some point over a bandwidth pipe, we're ready for that. We have digital television right now. Uh, I'm in the same boat. When I was on copper, when I was on the copper network at my house, the fastest internet they could get me due to distance limitations was 1.5 megabit. All they could get me was one standard deaf video feed. Now I have four kids. There's no way that my wife and our four kids are going to ever agree on one program to watch. Okay, there's no way. And so we were really limited on what we could do. But now I have four separate video feeds in my house, all HD. And I have 20 megabit internet connection, all on fiber to the home. It's unbelievable what this network can do, how resilient it is, how redundant it is, uh, and how advanced it is compared to the copper network. And so uh, when these uh, things happen and when they do occur, whether we're talking about uh, storms or unforeseen incidences or even technology advancements, uh, our network is ready to go. If there is a, a, any challenge besides uh, you know, the dog chewing up the drops, is uh, we now have a battery backup uh, that is required to power that ONT. So everybody that we install fiber to the home to gets this battery back up on the inside of their home. This will power that ONT for about eight to ten hours if used conservatively. Now if you're running wide open, it'll die much sooner than that. Um, and so before, if you, if you had the plant in the ground and a copper drop in the ground, um, for instance, at my house, I never lost phone service. I never lost internet service at my house because I had a, I had a copper drop in the ground. 
well now uh, I would have lost service after eight hours unless I could get this hooked up to a generator or some alternate power source uh, so you know that that is a limitation that wasn't there but we'll certainly take the the good that far outweighs the bad and, and deal with these type of situations uh, some people are using uh, other resources to power that ONT that doesn't allow them to get that into a um, into a generator in case something happens so automatically if you know if the power goes out and they're only out for three or four hours on a, a spring storm or something that battery backup I mean it's going to keep them running now if we have a, an ice storm if we have a, a major storm of some kind that would keep them without power for several days this battery is not is not going to be the solution but again plug this battery into a generator they're good to go as long as they got gas in that generator uh, so there's, you know, there's challenges like that that we have to deal with, uh, the drops in the ground, being exposed, the battery backup. Uh, but I think you can uh, tell uh, from my excitement and from the stats and the statistics that we've looked at, if that ice storm happens in 2014, uh, it'll be an entirely different experience for our network users, for our company, and for the people in the, the region that we serve versus it, as it was in 2009. So it was important to get uh, resilient, it was important to get um, redundant paths from all locations. Um, you know, me and Kevin were talking before I came up that, uh, you know, we have an iris uh, network that we connect to out of Nashville. And if you remember, they had a flood uh, a few years ago that really hindered that network and that hurt us because again we didn't have the resiliency in the network that we needed in order to be um, sufficient in those times so now with fiber to the home and, and flight you'll notice WKT is the name of the company but flight is our actual product that's our brand for our fiber to the home so as we deploy flight to our customers to our businesses to our residences in this area we're excited we're excited because we're going to give them more advanced services than they've ever had for this region in the rural areas but not only that we know that no matter what happens our network is ready uh, to go the distance and uh, we're excited about that um, before Kevin comes up, if there's any quick questions, I'll be happy to answer them. If not, Kevin's going to keep on talking about some of these very things. What role does this resiliency play in uh, your community's efforts at economic development and attract businesses? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question that you asked there. I mean, really, uh, we have talked about that with our uh, economic development teams and our councils. Uh, and it's played a part um, in some of the conversations that we've had. It's still a tough sale. I mean, you know, let's just be honest. It's a tough sale in, in rural western Kentucky. Uh, even with this technology and this resiliency and this redundancy, it's hard to, to get a, a place at the table with some of these guys. But we've had some conversations uh, with some companies that would have never looked at this area, never even thought of it or considered it, had this technology not, not been available. So it definitely has played a part. Anything else? If not, I'll turn it over to Kevin and he'll keep talking. My name is Kevin Ladd. I'm the Director of Network and Security Operations for Computer Services Incorporated. I've been with CSI for 17 years, uh, going on 17 years. Let's see, that needs to go back, I think. Now that's it. So anyway, um, what CSI is, I thought maybe not everybody in the audience might know who CSI is and what we do. We're a data processor for banks, for financial institutions. Um, we have several different divisions. New Point Division, Document Services Division. The New Point itself is, that's really the data processing for the banks. There are the accounts, um, the general ledgers, you know, account activity, things like this. The Document Services Division, that's more of a statement print shop, if you will regulatory and compliance division. Um, that's dealing with OFAC, um, it's dealing with terrorist activity, things along these lines, and I'm really trying to go fast because Michael knows that I talk a lot. Uh, we have a card services division, which is actually payment processing for ATM, debit cards, things along, along these lines. We're a PCI level one issuer processor. And then we have a managed service division, which is basically the telecommunications, all the IT for CSI, as well as the majority of our customers. 
So just a couple more pictures and I'll breeze through these really quick, but these were some pictures that I pulled uh, uh, from the ice storm. And as uh, Michael was talking, you can see the lines down there and the data communication lines. So really quickly impact our area, 90% without power or telecommunications. Um, cell phones weren't working. Um, not talking about any carriers, we had a couple of carriers in Paducah. We had one that was working and one that was not working. Uh, roads closed, nearly all businesses were closed, two hour waits for gasoline as Michael stated, no grocery stores, and a curfew imposed sundown to sunup in Paducah anyway. Uh, impact to CSI, lost our public power, so we switched our generators, uh, system fully operational, CSI has a luxury that we have a generators to in the event that we lose power from the utility company, we can run fully independent on our generators at CSI. And we're actually upgrading that, I think, to um, right now, I think we have about a four day on the tanks that we run, and I think we're moving that up to about a 10 day time frame, adding some new generators. Uh, so we lost our telecommunications. So actually on Tuesday, when the storm really started, acting up and you know getting pretty heavy and stuff we had, tel we had telecommunications up and down our data communication lines so CSI has host site in Valparaiso Indiana and has a host site in Paducah Kentucky Paducah being the primary for some customers and then Valparaiso being primary for other customers so our Paducah facility we started losing our data communication lines we had power but we lost our data communication lines and then that Tuesday evening, we totally lost all of our data communications lines. So we were in an island. We couldn't talk to anybody inside, outside. We had a very um, um, robust infrastructure with our telecommunication providers, but all of our telecommunication providers were down, whether it be because the aerial lines were broke or there was just something along those chains between Paducah and Valpo that we had gone out of service. So. Um, we decided to, CSI has a luxury, if you will. We have mainframes that we run at about 50, less than 50% capacity. And our mainframes, we can actually virtualize, if you will, and we can split them down the middle. So we can run 50% as a Valparaiso system and 50% as a Paducah system. So at five o'clock, um, we started shipping files and we started shipping personnel and I was one of the lucky ones to, to be involved in that event. So we drove to Marion, Illinois and we flew out of Marion and uh, we flew on for a better lack of terms some crop dusters from smaller planes. We had servers with us, we had data tapes with us, we had key personnel with us. And so we were making continual flights uh, starting there on Wednesday to go to Valparaiso after we declared a disaster. And so once we got things up there, what we had to do, well this is impact our customers. 166 banks that are processed out of Paducah Host, uh, they were offline. We had ATMs offline, so you have your debit cards that aren't working, and they're working from offline limits. So if you did have an ATM or if you weren't affected by this, then there's a limit that the bank can set that you can get a certain amount of money if we're not available. So uh, internet banking was not available, and so banks, because of this, had to implement their disaster procedures as well, because their processor was not available for them. So our recovery began, so what we did, like I said, we went to Valparaiso, Indiana, to our alternate host site, and we were taking systems, we were taking tapes, we were taking data sets, uh, we were taking everything we possibly could that we deemed as being critical where our banks couldn't function. And so we flew all that up there, we split the, we split the mainframe, we brought basically Paducah up in Valparaiso. And that includes networking equipment, that includes uh, servers and, and services that traditionally would primarily have been out of Paducah. We brought up Paducah and Valpo. So we took our Valparaiso, Valparaiso data center and we made it Paducah and Valpo. So that took us about 41 hours. Um, I was up that entire 41 hours, as well as a lot of other stuff. There's people laughing in the audience, and one of them works with me, and he knows what I'm talking about. Um, so, the lessons that we learned, you know, we've always gone through a rigorous set of business impact analysis, you know, enterprise risk management. Um, we went through, you know, um, 
everything that we thought was necessary until we became an island and this primary data center was no longer available to the rest of the world. And what we realized were we identified, you know, some mission critical systems for our customers that hadn't been deemed as mission critical up to this point. Uh, telecommunications redundancy needed to be reevaluated. Um, identified applications that could not be moved to off the site without moving the entire network. That was a really big deal. Uh, communicating channels to our customers were not adequate. So you have to think, Paducah, Kentucky, where your primary process is located, in the surrounding area within 60 or 70 miles, they didn't have this disaster. We have customers all over the place. And trying to communicate what was going on was, was deemed difficult. We were using a uh, cell phone. We did have cell phones on one carrier, like I said. And we were communicating what was going on out of Paducah to our folks in Valparaiso who were answering the phone, our alternate host site. So we were trying to communicate, because we were dead in the water, what the activities were and what, we what was going on. And so we realized after this that some of our communication to our customers was not adequate, so we stepped that up. Um, where are we today? So since we have the capacity to be split at any host site, now what we're doing is, is we're doing real-time replication between the two host sites. So we have sand uh, storage that has the capacity to where constantly Paducah, all the activity that's going on in Paducah right now as we speak is being replicated real time to our Valparaiso data center. It's no longer tapes anymore. We still do tapes, but the real time replication is going on constantly. And vice versa from, from Valparaiso back to Paducah, the same is happening. So if we did lose one of our data centers, now we have the data there, we know how to split the mainframe, we know how to bring all those systems up. And any ancillary systems or services that are basically not the mainframe, but support the mainframe and the services, the VMwares, all these types of virtualized environment that we've gone to, that's in a full replication as well, real time. Uh, so you can see the current's 9 to 11 terabytes daily. Well, that's nine terabytes from Paducah to, or from Valpo to Paducah, and then 11 terabytes from Paducah to Valpo is what we average on a daily basis of the amount of data that we are replicating. So we also, as it's got up here, server virtualization. We have uh, embraced virtualization probably as much as not anybody in this part of the area. Uh, CSI has about 1,100 servers. Probably we're in the eight to 900 of those servers are virtualized now. And the reason being we can use uh, things like Site Recovery Manager, which is a, a solution which allows you to take that server and give it a new IP address as opposed to having to move the whole network, if you will, and you can move that service at will. So we, we're a big user of that. Our programs have been redesigned to use a DNS name instead of an IP address. That, that's key because in uh, legacy systems, programmers would, would tend to point to an IP address as opposed to a name. So if you have a service, uh, and I'll use the internet for example, on the internet you go to google.com, that's www.google.com, as opposed to the IP address of where that service is. What we found is in some of our older uh, programs, we were using the IP address as opposed to the name, so now we have a name of like newpoint.csiweb.com. That allows us to move that service at will and give it a different IP address. So uh, that was something that was really huge for us. Telecommunications, we redesigned. Uh, we have a more diverse set of carriers. Like Michael was talking about, we have a lot of underground ground facilities now. Um, we go north, south, east, west with our telecommunications. So a diverse set of characters, or uh, carriers. Also with the capacity that if I lost any one or any two, I still have enough capacity to keep the business going as, as, as we expect. Um, we came up with a solution for an auto VPN is what we call it. And what that is, is, is if our customers or our, our primary center goes down and their communications is into that center, 
Now we have a solution for them to use an alternate carrier like a broadband connection or cable TV, whatever. And so what that'll do is fire up a VPN in the event we lose that center, and then it'll will redirect the communications to the alternate side for you to continue to be processed. Uh, communication channels have been enhanced. Uh, so what we've done there, our customers over a 10-day period, we put out 43 communications. A lot of our customers, we don't really know what happened, but our customers did not get those communications. So we have developed several different ways that we can get the information to our customers. We alert our customers that this is how the process that you go to to find out the information if you can't call us. And it's worked very well. Um, so the other really, really big thing that we've done is the scheduled testing of all applications to the alternate side. We go through an annual process where we test every application and we test them live. And so we'll go through a process where we'll take this service and we'll say, okay, for the next four or five days, we're going to move it to Valparaiso. We're going to move it from Valparaiso to Paducah. And we let customers run on that live to confirm that we are where we think we're supposed to be. And so that has worked really well for us. It's, it's taught us a lot of lessons to where um, we need to continue to enhance some of our software capabilities as opposed to a primary, secondary type of environment. We're looking at an active, active environment now to where it doesn't matter which data center that you're going to. So we've created a life cycle understanding that if we lose any one of our data centers for any given time, that we need to have that other service available because as everyone knows, as technology has increased, our patience has decreased greatly. And our expectations have increased tremendously. So 15, 20 years ago, if the bank was closed or something, then you probably didn't have an opportunity to check your balance. Maybe you did across the phone line or whatever. Today, you expect to be able to check your balance online from your computer get real access right now. If you don't, our patience is very thin. We're calling people. We want to know what's going on. So CSI as a corporation recognizes that. So we're trying to move to an active, active environment where our data center can do and uh, supply the information in real time, both to our bank customers as well as to their customers. Oh, I went through that really fast. Uh, so does anybody have any questions? Um, Okay. I don't know that this is relevant necessarily to your topic, but I found it remarkable that you um, have a staff of people located in um, here who, in a crisis like that, which affected them and their families personally, and you were able to get them out. I know it's their job, but. You know, you took them out of a out of a crisis situation that they were experiencing personally, and took them up to Valparaiso. And um, anyway, how do you come about such a staff that can leave their homes and their families in situations where you know there's some danger associated with being in homes without heat and electricity, and uh, you can't get get around very easily? So that's a fantastic question, and, and I. CSI is a very family-oriented company, and what's not on these slides is it's our people and our employees first. And so CSI, I don't know if you've been to Paducah or not, it's a, a probably an 85 to 100,000 square foot facility. Before I left on Wednesday, on Tuesday, there were uh, families there, there were pets there, there were children running away. You know, the first thing that we did was find out it, to, to the best of our ability is where our families. We rented over a hundred hotel rooms. I think my, it was it was over a hundred. We CSI rented over a hundred hotel rooms there in Paducah for families to come in and for them to stay there and for to make sure that they're safe. And then the employees that needed to go, you know, now we have a sense of you know families taken care of and uh, you know it's time to get the job done so people first and foremost in CSI people with the families and employees it's just a fantastic uh, place to work a lot of commitment from the CSI employees for the corporation that's a great point but personally uh, I was gone
alive for 10 days. So I talked to my sister eight days, me and Mike Stevens and, and, and John Art talked about this. I didn't have any communication with my family for eight days. And it was nerve wracking. But you know, uh, God willing, everything was turned out as it should. So, any other questions? So, I have a question. If nobody else does, I, I've got actually a bunch of questions. So, I'm thinking about a disaster recovery plan, and what plan, you know, plan A, plan B, plan Z was driving to Marion with servers in your car to get on a crop duster to flood a Valpo. So I guess it's, uh, that's a plan of, there were lots of meetings. We didn't have communication to the outside world. We had hourly meetings at time. We had updates in the morning and the afternoon. We would have 20 to 25 people, including the president and CEO, uh, you know, a variety of, of, of individuals that we would gather around a cell phone, we would tell Valparaiso what was going on, and then we would all go to our different conference rooms depending on what your function is at CSI, whether it be a customer service rep or a technical guy like me and my folks, and we would identify of what wasn't working and what needed to be done in order to make it work. So. There was a lot of whiteboarding that went on. There were a lot of systems that were identified that we had to take offline. Networks that had to be taken down so we could bring those up in Valparaiso. Uh, it was, um, it was, we know our systems very well and the personnel that we have and, 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 and we knew how to do it and we had the talent to do it. So, you can't really plan that you you know, until it happens, like, like what Michael was saying. We had some fantastic business impact and contingency plans and all those, but those have been enhanced so much since this outage. You know, we did our, uh, we did our failover testing. We did everything that, that we thought was uh, um, critical to the business, but until this happens to you, you, you really don't understand all the dependencies the criticality of, of this to you know even one customer that's maybe not to another customer. So we identified those through this process and we we've, we've taken our uh, business impact and our DR contingency to a, to a much more elevated level. I know that you back up, or you said you back up um, everything that you do at your Valparaiso plant and everything you do at your Paducah plant or facility on the servers at the other location. Um, but you also said that you continue to use a tape backup system. Is that right? Is I understand that correctly? We still do some tapes for local um, for local uh, redundancy as well. You know, it's local is always going to be quicker than remote. Right. The only question, those tapes, do you store those on site or you take them off site and store them in a vault or what do you do with we them? We take those off site and are stored in vaults uh, yeah. under lock and key and very, very stringent, you know, logs and, you know, it's, it's regulated by, through the FFIC, Federal Reserve, you know, all the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other Where's that at? I can't tell you that. It's all, in, you know, Michael. That's a nice try. But it's all, it's all encrypted, and uh, you couldn't do anything with it anyway. So it would just be, it would just be metal or tapes. Kevin, knowing I'm asking you to look into a crystal ball a little bit, you moved into the building you're in what 20 years ago, something thereabouts. Uh, 99, yeah. And I know so. that you had a huge overview of everything in the, the systems design and processes and all that. When the ice storm came, you found inadequacies in that, and you started using the term in your presentation, systems uh, life cycle. How do you update this plan? And the crystal ball part is, if the ice storm happened today, 
what would your customers in this area see differently? Would they would they still be down? Can you can you go into that? A couple of things, fantastic questions. From from the crystal ball perspective, we watch and manage our network and our systems, and we have uh, high water marks that once we get to a high water mark on, on any particular system. We're looking at, at replicating that, making that a bigger system, or actually running two systems parallel to do the same function. We do a lot of that. The virtualization gives us a lot of opportunities there. Um, as far as if it happened today, because of technologies like MPLS, our customers, for the majority of, of, of our customers, have an MPLS type of connection. And what we do is, is we have what we refer to as host ports and those MPLS connections, and I'll just use any one particular carrier. We're gonna have a connection that comes into our Valparaiso Center as well as our Paducah Data Center that has the capacity in the event I either lose that telephone circuit that's carrying all those customers, I have the capacity at either location to carry all the traffic like when the other one goes away. So it's capacity planning, it's monitoring, um, it's an ongoing thing. We're always looking for ways to streamline processes, um, not have as much data, but um, really it's just managing the network, managing the infrastructure, and having the capacity to, uh, because it's expensive to CSI to have that type of capacity that you're not using all the time. It's, 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 it's expensive, but it's a, it's a cost to business. I think we have time for one more question if anybody's got it. That means that you all get to lunch faster than the other group. Uh, before we wrap up, let me make a couple of announcements. Lunch is next. Uh, it is back down the hallway, kind of out where the, the sponsor tables are. Well, it's the small ballroom uh, for those that know the Murray State lingo. Uh, and we'll have lunch in there, and then we'll be back in here after lunch for our, our luncheon speaker. We're actually going to come back in here uh, to hear that presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions on directions, you know, look for me or, or for any of the Murray State folks, and we can point you in the right direction. Um, with that, Oh, and the only oh. other thing is, I am a graduate of the TSM program. So Phil, Sc <laughs> Phil Scully wanted me to say that, and, and I finished that when I was 48 years old, which was uh, a couple years back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well,